physicality stops seeming literally true, then that softens all the notion of separation all the way down so that you won't feel even as alienated from your own different parts of your own psyche. And there's another, uh, something that happened to me <clears throat> when I was in the army. I studied a lot of philosophy. I was always interested in philosophy and always right, passionately interested in it, not just academically. I didn't have the desire to write papers and become famous. I was looking at it, to, looking at it for, I wanted to dive in and discover. And so I studied um, idealism. I studied um, Brand Blanchard. And he has a way of discussing objects. Like take an apple. <clears throat> um, there's no real substance or core, like existential core of an apple. It's red in a certain shape, white in a certain shape, combined sort of like close in space to each other with whatever else you can name about that apple. Just list all those attributes and they're just redness. Take just the skin, the redness of the skin. That very redness can exist somewhere else, in another apple or in a stop sign or something. It's just red and white and chewy and textured, granular. And those are all attributes that are sort of able to be unpacked from each other. And that's how, so that allowed me to experience things as almost um, penetratable not as solid and, and um, like a barrier to entry, to conceptual entry or to even like enter with my mind or even with my hand or something like that. It seemed like I could do that. And then in graduate school studying philosophy, I studied George Berkeley, And he's the Western philosopher who's very similar to Atmananda. <clears throat> he, he, he's the guy who said, Barclay's the guy who said that if a tree falls in the forest, and there's no one to hear it, then it didn't make a sound. In other words, an object only exists if it's an idea in a mind. If it's not an idea, then there's no way that it, there's no way that it can be unless it's perceived. There's no evidence that it exists outside of perception. So I was in a class whose uh, teacher was one of the world's great Barclay scholars. And he said that we all had to, he said, he, he had tenure, he, he was almost a professor emeritus, which meant that he, you know, he was there for life as long as he wanted the position. And he was a very, very good teacher and very passionate about Barclay. And he said, if you want a good grade in this class, then you should probably write a paper in favor of Barclay, because then your paper doesn't have to be that good, because Barclay's right. Everybody else is wrong. If you write a paper against Barclay, you have to do a really good job because you're going against the truth. <laughs> so the standards are going to be higher. So your paper has to be better. So a lot of us got together and said, we better write, like, try to write pro Barclay papers if we want a good grade in this class. We really had to study Barclay a lot harder than we would have otherwise. And so I studied it really hard. And I had Brand Blanchard in, behind me already. So I already didn't think that objects were solid and fixed. <clears throat> so with Barclay, it just like gelled, his arguments just gelled, that to be is to be perceived. Esse is percipi, he called it in Latin. So it just like gelled, and I went into the professor, his name was uh, Colin Murray Turbane. I said, Professor Turbane, I got it, and I must have had this gleam in my eye, this like fanatic gleam in my eye. And he said, Yes. Now go tell others. <laughs> so um, that was years and years before I was even interested in self-inquiry. It was just a way to, now objects had lost all their solidity. I didn't think of objects as solid at all. I thought of them as ideas. And it was only like after that point that I had the courage to like learn rollerblading and learn like this track bike riding, you know, bicycles with no brakes in the city, or rollerblades with no brakes in the city, you know, skating downstairs and going in traffic and stuff like that. It was only after that that I didn't experience objects as concrete external substance that 
I sort of had the motivation to do that. And that was before um, this non-dual inquiry. So by the time I started the non-dual inquiry, I already didn't think of myself as a body. Remember earlier I was trying to figure out what I was. I didn't think the body wasn't the big candidate because the body wasn't anything substantial or physical anyway. That's why I landed on the idea that it was probably that which, you know, what gives me my character? Well, that my tendency to choose and decide in certain ways. And according to the reincarnational teachings that I, I didn't quite believe in them, but I was sort of taking them at face value, say, well, they must, maybe they're onto something because they all seem to agree about these things. And one of the things that they can agree upon is that these tendencies will reinstantiate themselves. Like next life, you'll have somebody who um, like, maybe likes the same kind of music or is drawn to art in the same way, maybe not the same pieces, but you know, the same broad tendencies. And so I thought something along those lines is what makes me what I am or what makes anyone what they are. But I didn't think it was anything physical. And I think that the physical, the tendency to think in physical terms is, I think, um, probably the greatest barrier to this understanding. Because even if someone feels separate from their thoughts, you know, like I feel alienated from myself, or <clears throat> my heart feels alienated from my mind, or I feel alienated from a loved one, then the conceptual model they're using is probably physical. They might be even visualizing a physical barrier between one part of themselves and another part. The part, maybe think of the heart being compartmentalized away from the thinking apparatus or something. And that's just a, a physical metaphor that they're taking seriously, they're taking literally. But if that gets softened up and the physicality stops seeming literally true, then that softens all the notion of separation all the way down. so that you won't feel even as alienated from your own different parts of your own psyche than you did before. Because you won't, you won't visualize it in physical terms, and physical terms are very, they seem very uh, forbidding, you know, intransigent, and um, like impenetrable, like there's a wall, I just can't get through it. And we could feel that way about different aspects of the personality or, you know, from one personality to another, you can feel that way, using a, like a physical, a physical construct or physical metaphor for our notion of separation. So once that, that's a major barrier I've found in working with other people also, I've found that the physicality is a major barrier, the notion.